And what I'm suggesting, we have to do that without getting into, you know, it's easy to pontificate when you're not talking about specifics, but it's a tax and spending reform. Um, I was on a, I was on a, what, what, the whole debate over taxes, I think, is, has been unfortunate because it's, it's only been, do we raise taxes or do we lower taxes? It's not been, do we change the taxes? The, the, the governor's tax reform uh, group uh, for competitiveness, I think it's competitiveness for the 21st century or something, had some really good ideas about how we change, how we change the tax structure to, to make it more uh, economically viable. Um, but because of the debate over do we tax or not tax, it sort of scares people away from even talking about reform. I mean, you can, you can expand the base of the sales tax and lower the rate and not take in any more revenue. That's a separate decision. But there's some things we should do from a stability and tax policy standpoint that we're not even talking about. Spending the same thing, too. I, I, was, on a, uh, I was on a panel uh, a few weeks ago at the Center for the American Experiment. And uh, the topic was, what have you learned about uh, cutting budgets in your career. And uh, when it came my turn to talk, I said, well, what I've learned, it's really easy to cut budgets. I've been cutting budgets for 40 years. It's really hard to do it well. And by well, I mean in such a way that it makes us stronger for the long term. I mean, when you're operating your business, you're not going to, you're not going to do it in such a way when, you, when you're cutting back, you're not doing it in such a way that it's going to weaken your future growth. Uh, you're going to do it in such a way that it better positions you. And I'm not sure we're doing that in Minnesota. We're not making the cuts that we need to make in a way that makes us stronger in the long run. So, and finally, I think it's the investing in productivity. And I, I say this because uh, one of the messages that Stinson and Gillespie have is that uh, the growth we have in the future, the economic growth we have in the future, won't be as robust for, for one reason. Uh, one of the main reasons is that the, uh, we don't have as many workers in the workforce. The growth we've had, we can kind of see this in this room. Uh, as women entered the workforce over, over the last decade, last decades, that was in large part uh, driving much of our economy. We now have two worker families. That's not going to happen again. Well, I guess we could go to three worker families if we redefine the definition of marriage. No, I'm actually, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I got it. <laughs> oh, and this is on tape, too, I think. So I, that's what. <laughs> but uh, I think the key is to, we have to invest in productivity. So there's different ways to, to increase economic growth, and that's investments in productivity. And I'd say there's a role for government in this. And uh, uh, well, one, one I'll, I'll skip to the second one first, which is we need to incent private investment. Uh, one thing the legislature and the governor did this year, which was uh, a very long needed thing, was to pass the angel investment credit. I mean, that was uh, good for them. It's that sorts of things that we need to do to incent private investment uh, in productivity um, and more. I think on the, on the government side, I think the government needs to invest in things that help improve our competitiveness, our, our economic competitiveness in Minnesota. And uh, interestingly, I, uh, has anybody in here read the state constitution? Anybody? Oh, surprising number. Good, good. Uh, you know, I asked this in a, uh, I was talking to a group of League of Women Voters not too long ago, and I asked that question, everybody raised their hand. In fact, uh, one lady said, I have a copy right here. <laughs> I was thinking, uh, but what it says is that there are two main services, government services, that are focused. Now we do a lot of things, and there's other stuff in there too, but the two main government services that are in the state constitution, uh, does anybody know what those are? Education? And transportation, yeah, it's roads and, uh, and education. Now we do other things too. I mean, it's not to say that's what, but those are the things I, I would argue are, have the most to do with our competitive position in Minnesota. It's not only the transportation, because we're, I mean, we're not, we're not close to markets here. Um, we need the transportation infrastructure to remain competitive. And probably the single most thing that makes it, gives us our edge and well now the global economy is uh, our education. We have, we've always had a very well-educated and entrepreneurial workforce. And that's, I think, logically then and arguably where we should be focusing our efforts. Uh, not to say that we should just keep funding everything as they are today. I mean, uh, both of those areas, and I think particularly education, needs a serious look at what type of reforms 
do we need in that area? And actually this race to the top, I think, was kind of one of those kicks to say, we need to look at this. Uh, I mean, whether we get that money or not, I think it's at least open the debate that we need to do things better. So I want to leave you with, a, with one, um, and this is my kind of uh, uh, call to arms for everyone, and I think it's not just uh, kind of what do we need to do in government, but if you remember anything of what I talked about today, if, if you could remember this image I'd ask you to, and the image is we need to plant more trees. Uh, the best time to plant, plant a tree was 10 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. And that's the long-term focus that I think we've lost in a lot of our lives. Individually, I think, as well as in our, in our various uh, systems that we, we deal with, is that we need to think long-term. Are the decisions we're making today going to put us in a better position or a weaker position in the long run? So thank you for listening. I'd be glad to take some questions if you'd like. Great, thank you. start out with um, asking one quick question that you could provide and then we'll we'll open that up so think about your questions I'm, I'm buying time right now I think they will finish on time and I don't think oh no that was the no other no I'm done. <laughs> no the, the question I have is kind of a technical one but so if the legislature ratifies the unallotments which if we're gonna the get right that's one yeah the right one is yours oh. yeah you're good um, so which I and, and I will say I think they're gonna get done by Sunday at midnight I do so if they ratify any of the unallotments, what does that do to the 5.4 or 5.8 billion next biennium? Does that lower that by ratifying those unallotments? Um, I can't give you a good answer because uh, what it depends on is if, if the cuts are, uh, are permanent, then that would reduce the future. Uh, and there's usually a combination. Some cuts are one time, some are permanent. I think uh, many of them were. Uh, uh, permanent, weren't they? Yeah. So I think, uh, but it was, I think, totaled up to about a billion dollars maybe. So yeah, that would, that would have an effect on. So there, you got another billion you on go. your way to solving Shifting that. that. So. Okay. Do your trends and numbers include inflation on the spending side? They, they include inflation on both sides. That was actually our, our uh, panel of 15 thought that was the best way to do it. So and that's largely what's driving the uh, long-term care costs. It's not just the numbers of all of us with gray hair, but it's the costs of providing that. Yeah. Do you want me to call? Or? Yeah. yeah. Oh. John. Bill. John. Yeah, thank you. Uh, two questions, John. One on the revenue side where you showed the state sales tax producing about $9.2 billion. Was that inclusive of the county level taxes that flow uh, in terms of purchasing and so forth, that's number one. Uh, the answer is no, that's just the state collections. And that would be an interesting number because the uh, purchasing decisions that a lot of consumers are making now in Hennepin County are quite frankly somewhat related to that, that uh, particular sales tax because if you buy a car in another county, it's less than it is if you buy it in Hennepin County. Interestingly, uh, 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 the counties had a proposal this year that didn't go very far, but it's kind of an interesting proposal. They say, uh, stop funding us state, but give us a sales tax. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be a trade-off they'd like to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously a lot of distributional issues when you do that. Like, <clears throat> I'd love to have a city sales tax because we have Ridgedale. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, it makes no sense from a policy standpoint to do that because it, we, we are a metro area. I mean, we, we wouldn't make sense just as an isolated city. We're part of the whole metro area. Mm -hmm. And then to your question of the new normal that you talked about, the colleague gave you as an idea of looking at new things. Why then should we not tax Indian gambling in the state of Minnesota? I assume that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> I'll leave that to the folks that will vote on something like that. But. Um, I've, I've never been a big gambling fan uh, in any way, whether we tax it or, or support gambling. I, in fact, I, um, <clears throat> I, I think maybe it's just part of my uh, sort of uh, values system as I've never thought that government should be in the business of, of supporting in any way sort of the, the gambling practices, but I'm sorry. Um, I, I think it's something I don't believe it should be outlawed. I mean, I think that's something that certainly is, uh, is part of our culture, but I'm, I'm not sure that we should be looking at raising money uh, for things as fundamental as schools 